everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this inaugural section. I would like to, uh, on behalf of the executive board of the Center for Social Studies, I'd like to formally welcome you uh, to this inaugural lecture of the Serge uh, doctoral programs. Uh, every year, this welcoming week is a particularly inspiring moment for us here at SEJ. We gather the new members of this academic community that many of you have now joined uh, and to debate and provoke and engage some of the leading scholars of the different fields that we um, harbor here um, in our postgraduate training. Uh, and this year is, of course, no exception. Uh, Professor Michael Barnett's work is a structural reference uh, in the field of international relations, uh, contributing both to the theorization of the field and to the development of detailed and committed uh, empirical analysis of some of the central issues of our time. Um, his work uh, stands out as being powerfully engaged with some of the normative dimensions of international governance structures and with some of the most fragile humanitarian situations, be it refugees, genocide, or war, more broadly. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Professor Barnett's work, he is currently professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is also a member of the prestigious Council on Foreign Relations and associate editor for International Organization, which is just the most prestigious journal in the field of IR. He has published uh, widely on some of the most pressing and central issues at the heart of international relations, including power, norm diffusion and global governance, security communities, theories of international relations, um, on, at the regional level, the Middle East, uh, on ethics and humanitarianism, including the Rwandan genocide. Uh, he's the author of several award-winning books, including Eyewitness to a Genocide, the United Nations at, uh, in Rwanda, and with Martha Finnemore, Rules for the World, uh, International Organizations in World Politics, as well as um, the book Empire of Humanity, A History of, of Humanitarianism. His scholarly writings have appeared in major professional uh, journals, including International Organization, International Studies Quarterly, European Journal of International Relations, World Politics, Cultural Anthropology. Uh, his most recent publication at Cambridge University Press is the edited volume Patronalism Beyond Borders. Professor Barnett, it's uh, my absolute privilege uh, to welcome you at SESH and here at the School of Economics at the University of Coimbra. We are extremely uh, happy to have shared these insights of your work through the last days. And we are, of course, uh, particularly looking forward to your keynote address today on <coughs> is suffering a source of global progress. So without further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. The topic is a little unusual, and it's something that I've been struggling with for quite a while, and I'm now trying to formulate these thoughts into something coherent, uh, and you'll be the judge of whether and how far I'm along. Uh, but, but this is, you know, while I've been dabbling with these broad questions for some time, especially in the case of uh, the context of my work on humanitarianism, the idea of putting it together with progress may seem a little unusual, but I, what I hope to do is explain uh, in a way that makes it actually common sense. And if I can actually convince you that this is a kind of, uh, if you will, a kind of intuitive way of understanding moral progress, that this comes from suffering, then I've done my work, or at least if, I, if you engage it, then I, I can take the train back to Lisbon happy. Um, so, as I said, I, I've been thinking about these questions about the relationship between inhumanity and humanity uh, for some time. And humanitarianism really does encapsulate that, uh, that tension or that uh, binary, uh, because humanitarianism is very much about the attempt to relieve the suffering of distant strangers. That's how I define it. Uh, and some of the suffering that we talk about in humanitarianism is about, from acts of God, natural disasters. So this is human nature. Uh, but most of, the, uh, most of the emergencies that incite us, that compel us to watch, uh, 
are not, uh, not natural disasters, but humanly made disasters. Uh, they're the ones that grab our attention. They're the ones that make us wince. Uh, they're the ones that oftentimes make us go for our app on our smartphone uh, to contribute to the cases that we see. And just to sort of go through at least some of the events that I've engaged with, I, you know, it's just, you know, it rolls. It's just, it's a history of the last century for the most part. It's World War I and World War II. Uh, it's the Holocaust. It's Biafra. It's Bangladesh. It's Cambodia, Ethiopia, Somalia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Kosovo, East Timor, Syria, and the current plight of the Rohingya. Uh, that this is actually, wherever you see a big event and a lot of disaster, that's what humanitarianism is about. And we often narrate the history of the century, not just simply through violence, but through suffering. It is at those moments where you look and you see inhumanity. This is what we often struggle with, is how could these things happen? But at the same time, though, the topic that I engage, humanitarianism, is often seen as an indicator of moral progress. It is the fact that we now have, you know, thinking more broadly about this, that we have public health and human rights and gender empowerment and, you know, forms of uh, intervention for, for global education and ultimately for emergency relief that is seen as a sign that maybe we actually can move forward morally that we help others. And it is out of willingness to feel compassion, to provide care and assistance, that is itself a mark of our humanity. It is about recognizing the humanity of others, and in doing so, realizing our own humanity. And if you dare to even think that you don't care, that's a sign of your inhumanity. So, you know, you, you find these tensions I think that humanitarianism is both a sign of suffering and an alleviation of suffering. And so at that moment, it really is a, a, it, it is a time in which we bring together these questions of inhumanity and humanity. And I've sort of thought long and hard about how these things might go together. And it's not just in the moment, but rather, as I want to suggest today, I think it's actually, if you will, inhumanity that helps to account for the movement in moral progress. And I'll define those terms in a minute. But just to sort of, I, I think, set up maybe the heretical nature of the argument, uh, we, you know, moral progress is actually not a politically correct term. We don't tend to use it. People shy away from it for a variety of reasons because we don't know what progress is and we're always worried that we're going to impose our definition of progress on somebody else. So we tend not to use the language of progress. It's an old-fashioned modernist term. So we're, we're done with that. I still kind of use it. Uh, I use it in a particular way. And uh, over the last several years, I think we've seen a lot of scholarship that has, for all intents and purposes, tried to explain how there's moral progress. And by the, uh, by the idea of moral progress, they often mean examples of positive and negative duties. Positive duties in the sense that we need to be proactive and to help alleviate suffering. Negative duties in the sense that we should not cause other people's harm that if we can avoid it, then we should. We have a moral responsibility to avoid the commitment of unnecessary suffering. And two of the extraordinary books, I think, uh, over the last five years that have contributed to our thinking about this is Steven Pinker's book, uh, the, Ang the Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, which is this you know, massive accomplishment, which I assigned to my undergraduates at one point, which I think was a human rights violation. <laughs> At least that's the way they responded. Uh, and Andrew Linklater's work on civilizing processes and regimes of harm prevention. And one of the things that they argue, and they and I, and so they're they're trying to think about this question uh, of moral progress is the simultaneous decline of violence and intolerance and the rise of attempts to intervene to reduce suffering. 
and that you know that those are clearly connected. But in many ways, though, they're grappling with sort of how do we explain this? And I have to say, uh, given though that lecture is about inhumanity, uh, this is actually good news. Uh, we don't have a lot of good news these days. Uh, at least I don't have much good news to report from Washington, D.C. And this is good news. It's about progress. Uh, and as people try, as these scholars try to uh, grapple with these questions, they pull on a number of, of um, you know, these are multi-causal arguments. These are big changes, so they deserve, uh, you know, to be um, uh, understood in a multiplicity of ways. But they talk about civilizing processes, cognitive and emotional development, which is part of Pinker's argument, uh, various kinds of sanctions for those who violate these norms of civility, and the like. And not rewarding people for public displays of cruelty, which is a sign of the times. These changes have, I think, uh, coalesced into something that the anthropologist Didier Fassin talks about, in, and this is the language I use of humanitarian governance, but something that Didier Fassin calls humanitarian governance, which he defines as the administration of human collectivities in the name of a higher moral principle that sees the preservation of life and the alleviation of suffering as the highest value of action. And I think that's right. What we've seen over the last several centuries is this idea that governance, that we should actually alleviate suffering. And we find domestic and global institutions increasingly organized around those sensibilities and at the end of the day, whether we talk about security or economic governance, those two are oftentimes talked about as well in, the ter in terms of the alleviation of suffering. So I think he and other anthropologists who are talking about, not normatively whether we should be there, but empirically, historically, that we've moved in this direction. Uh, and that's one of the things that I've been in some ways mesmerized by, is that at the global level, we do have, we have seen these global institutions of compassion. I, I think this is remarkable. And, you know, I, I'm cynical, so I don't know how well they work, but they exist. And it's the existence that I think is worth thinking about. Now, historians and social scientists largely agree that this kind of sense of progress is not smooth and linear. It, it is something rough and oftentimes regressive. But what we, what we see from the data is that these kinds of changes that are measures of moral progress tend to happen around wars. You see a stepwise change, and you can see it after, in, in a variety of ways, whether it was after the concert of Europe, uh, World War I, World War II, uh, various kinds of major humanitarian emergencies, Rwanda, and what we see is that these sort of moments of mass inhumanity seem to precede this moment in which there is this concentrated effort to build global institutions of compassion. And I think there's something about this moment that's important to think about. And the way a lot of, at least international relations theorists think about it is that these are moments of learning. That you learn from the past and this is what makes us reason rational actors. We look at the past, try to derive lessons, best practices, and do our best and move on. Right? So that's, that's the, that informs us that we're actually rational, modern individuals. We can actually learn from the past. I actually, you know, I don't want to dispute that there's some of that, but I actually think in this, that there's a crisis of spirituality that's missing from this rationalist view. These are events, and this is, you know, this is a big chunk of the argument. These are events, the ones I've talked about, that undermine the confidence in our own humanity, that challenge the idea, the conviction, and the belief that there is moral progress. In short, they represent, oh, I'm already behind again, okay. They represent a crisis of faith. 
That's a good image, so that one actually works, okay? Um, and so I'm seeing these events, and this is partly the way I've read humanitarianism over the last, you know, as I've done the research over the last several years, is that humanitarianism in that sense then, in, 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 its, in, its, in its measure and in its response, is very much about trying to answer that crisis of faith. That these moments of massive suffering, and that's from Dachau, these moments of massive suffering challenge us in a way that I need to learn from the past. The issue of the Holocaust was not I need to learn from the past, that we're not supposed to you know, mass exterminate an entire population. Okay, that's, that seems trivial. But rather, it's how are we capable as humans, how are we capable of such action? That's a crisis of the soul. And so, the consequence then is, how do you recover from that? How do you recover from this crisis of inhumanity? And the consequence then is that I think a lot of what proceeds these moments is that there's a spiritual labor designed to recover our sense of humanity and confidence in the Western narrative of progress. And this is largely a Western story. So I want to unpack this argument, and for the first time, I'm on cue. Um, there, there are basically, well, there's five steps, and I'll end with a six. Um, th this is sort of the, the, this is the structure of the argument, so just to, in, in some ways, foreshadow it. That the first is that there's a Western narrative, which I want to work through very quickly, uh, but there is a sort of underlying narrative that, in my view, simply exists as definite is constitutive of the West, which is about enlightenment, compassion, humanity, and progress. These are things that in the West, you know, give us a sense of fundamental belief. I mean, there are some, they are, I think it, in many ways, at a theological level, a secular theological level, which is something I'll, I'll pick up on later. The second is that there's massive suffering, which, and this is, you know, we have to make suffering meaningful. Suffering can't just be a fact. We need to make sense of it. And this becomes particularly pressing at the third step, which is evil. And that's kind of, again, one of these old-fashioned theological terms. Um, but, but what basically happens, I think, in, and this is where I follow Susan Neiman's work, who's a philosopher, uh, who basically says, you know, I'm not going to say that there's a definition of evil. What I'm interested in is what do people at a particular moment take to be evil? They use that term, it has meaning to them. And so let's take it on, in that sense, in, in that kind of, in, on the interpretivist plane. And, you know, this evil is something that I think haunts us. Again, it's a particular kind of evil that we associate with our own moral failings. It's not the evil that others have done. It's the evil that we're complicit in. And what is that evil? I mean, and this is where the learning, when you try to understand, and this is the part of the argument where I'm, in many ways, uh, less sure, but this is where when we look at the sources of evil, and this is kind of the modernist narrative, when you look at the sources of evil, it oftentimes is about nationalism. Or I would say the sources of evil are put at the doorstep of ideologies of exclusion. Whether it's tribalism in the modern international system, it's about nationalism. But these are exclusionary ideologies that create differences between self and other, and as a consequence in this process of othering, say that the suffering of others doesn't matter, or that your suffer that I can justify my actions that lead to your suffering. These moments, I think, create a, 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 uh, a counter movement, though. The sources of evil, the way we respond to it, is through cosmopolitanism. 
is through forms of cosmopolitanism, is that we will respond to the evil and will respond to these ideologies of exclusion by creating ideologies of inclusion. We'll widen the circle of the community. So that's, that's kind of the argument in a nutshell. Uh, and, that, and I'm going to try to unpack it um, in, in the time that's remaining. So uh, the first step in the argument is about the Enlightenment. Uh, I'm not a historian, so I'm going to really skip, I'm an international relations theorist, so we actually don't do history, or we don't do history well. I mean, history for us is a data set. Uh, it's not something that we actually really think about. Uh, and so, you know, what historians, I think at least is the way I would sort of, sort of try to sort of gather their thoughts in terms of the Enlightenment, is that this is basically a set of processes, complicated processes, that take place over, you know, a long century that really begin to crystallize in the 18th century. And it produces changes in religion and science and markets and politics and culture but for me, what's important is that they're organized around issues of humanity and progress. This becomes a central feature of the narrative of the West and the Enlightenment. And with reason, we have an emphasis on, with the, we have an emphasis on the ability that we can actually improve ourselves and we can make the world a better place. We can learn, we can educate, we can be better than our parents. Uh, and a whole lot better than our grandparents. And so we can improve, and we can improve through various kinds of reflections, through new scientific methods, through new forms of epistemology, and we can be better than, than we were. And as a consequence, we will develop new kinds of technologies and skills and resources that will help to improve everyone's lot. We will escape from nature, something I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the second is compassion, and this is something that you know many cultural historians, including uh, Lynn Hunt and others, who do who sort of look at the origins of human rights, will talk about that in the late 18th century as a moment where you begin to see compassion, and these become meta feelings. Excuse the gendered aspect, but this is the, the way uh, uh, the conversation goes. Uh, that humans are now men of feelings, and in many ways, what they're trying to suggest is that in contrast to the Hobbesian image of individuals and humans being mechanical and soulless and asocial, now there's a sense that, in fact, to be fully human means that we are compassionate, and being compassionate becomes a measure of somebody's worth. So this is a moment where to feel compassion becomes a social metric that we use to identify ourselves as moral human beings. And so there's a growing appreciation for an ability to exhibit compassion or what some other uh, historians would call new forms of regimes of sympathy. So this is a breakthrough and this is something that you know I've thought a lot about in terms of the origins of humanitarianism and Part of that compassion is bundled up with notions of humanity. This is a relatively recent term. Uh, there is a dispute about its actual vernacular origins, but there's a sense in which it really comes together, the concept, the discourse comes together in uh, the late 18th century, and middle 18th century, late 18th century, in which the presumption now, and this is a breakthrough, is that all individuals are humans, all humans are equal and capable of reason, and because humans form a common species, they are obligated to treat other humans as a member of the family. Not, of course, everyone thinks this way, but this becomes a new set of arguments that people have to contend with. Part of this is sometimes drawn with the uh, notion of sentimentality, and as Lynn Festa, who's a cultural uh, historian, observes, this is a moment where it is to incite our feelings to overcome barriers. 
It, it is to make humanity possible. And one of the keys that I'll point to in a moment is this question of how do we make humanity possible? How is it that we bring down those barriers? The humanity also, and I'll be very brief here, is increasingly seen as sacred. There is this process of secularization that becomes dominant in the 19th century, but alongside it, as Emil Durkheim and others talked about it, there's also this process of sanctification. As you begin to move authority away from God, it becomes transferred to the human. And so, as Durkheim says, the human now becomes a sacred, the object of a sort of religion, a common faith. And as Hans Joas, a philosopher, a sociologist, recently notes in, 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 his, in his recent book, it is the growing beliefs, belief in the idea of universal human dignity, that every single human being has increasingly, and with every increasingly motivational and sensitizing effects, becomes viewed as sacred. Every soul is sacred on their own terms because they're human. These set of arguments then lead to notions of progress. And many times our notions of progress are bound up with material forces. So economic wealth. So we know there's progress if there's an increase in per capita income. Or there's a decline in the poverty rate. These are measures we use of progress. The UN has a lot of measures of these progress and, you know, depending on which measures you look at, we're doing okay or we're not doing as okay as we think we are. There's also moral progress, which was in many ways, I think, a greater concern to a lot of historians. And that moral progress was about developing our higher emotions and feelings. This is in part what Pinker's arguing in terms of cognitive and emotional development. Humans had always demonstrated the capacity for self-interest. This was not news. What was news was that they now have the capacity for other regarding behavior. And this becomes a demonstration that they are producing a form of moral progress. And part of that moral progress is also bound up with the concept of humanity that we recognize that all individuals are human and we need to act that way in new ways. Underlying all these claims, and this is contentious, is that there's an unshakable belief that progress is inevitable. Now, I'm very aware that there are alternative views, critical theory, Nietzsche and others, who dispute this question about whether progress is inevitable. But I would argue that part of the central, part of the Western narrative that keeps us going is the idea that progress is inevitable, which, you know, sets up the uh, part of my conclusion. This is all tied centrally to questions of reason. And this is, you know, this is part of what's going on in the late 18th century, early 19th century is that suffering becomes a problem. And what you know, some sociologists like Ian Wilkinson and uh, public health folks like Aaron Kleiman would argue is that it becomes a social problem in the sense that we now are looking at the social causes of suffering and we now begin to wonder about the social interventions we can engage in to reduce suffering. And with the Enlightenment, the presumption then is that if we use our intellect and the technology and scientific reason, we can actually not only explain suffering, but we can do something about it. So no longer is suffering something that is in the hands of God. It's rather something that is in the hands of humanity. It's something that we can do to make it better. And so this is Barrington Moore, a very famous sociologist, who argued then is that men gain control over the physical aspects of their environment. Secular explanations of suffering eventually permeated the understanding of social and political affairs, even if they did not yield in social affairs to the same degree of control. 
And so what he's arguing then is that yes, our moral development is outpacing our institutional capacities, but and they'll never catch up. But our moral development is moving in important ways, and we're trying to apply political institutions now to try to deal with these problems. Compassion now becomes tied inevitably to suffering, and we show compassion publicly and most explicitly when other people are seen as in harm. Oh. I want to go back. Okay, yes. This is one of Hannah Arendt's very famous quotes from On Revolution, uh, and in which she says, and again, trying to chart what's going on in the late 18th century, a lot of times, you know, not just simply bound up with the French Revolution, but with other processes, is that she notes that, whereas once the spectacle of misery could not move men to pity, by the way, she doesn't have a great view of the phenomenon of pity, uh, in the 18th century, this age-old indifference began to disappear when, in the words of Rousseau, an innate repugnance at seeing fellow creatures suffer, which had become common in certain strata of European society. What she's trying to notice is that suffering now becomes intolerable. We must do something about it, and we need to, and that becomes the mark of our compassion. In fact, it goes so far that, you know, one of the ways I think about this is that what we've now begun to create is a cosmopolitanism of suffering. That we, and this is the next part of the argument then, we identify with people when they're at their most miserable and worst. Dalai Lama. Here, as he says, we must recognize that the suffering of one person or a nation is the suffering of humanity. Well, I find this actually a very, you know, I think this encapsulates a lot of what people are thinking about, but it says to us and encourages us to imagine then humanity as working through the streams of suffering. So that I'm only going to identify with you if you're miserable. The moment you become less miserable, that it's over. And oftentimes when we talk about humanitarianism as a sign of cosmopolitanism, what we really mean is that some people who are in a position to give are helping others who are in a position of need. But as a consequence, this cosmopolitanism is very fleeting. And it's dependent on a cosmopolitanism of suffering. So we only know our humanity and others when they are at their most worst. This creates its own form of hierarchies and inequalities. It creates a globalization of pity that I don't actually think is all that savory. Uh, but that's part of, I think, the link between humanity and suffering. And then finally, there is the idea that suffering will bring us progress. And as Martin Luther King said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. So you can't actually accomplish anything unless you sacrifice and suffer, which is which will go back to one of these arguments, I'll, which will foreshadow one of the arguments I'll, I'll present in a moment. So progress then becomes our ability to mitigate suffering, and part of the drive to con gain control over nature is for the purpose of intervening in society to improve human welfare. This is, a, a, I think, a, a fairly conventional interpretation of a lot of claims about modernity. Uh, Ian Wilkinson has written, you know, kind of in his own interpretation of Marx and Weber, which says that their own ideas of, you know, whether it's sort of changes in the modes of production, or for Weber about going from um, sort of traditional forms of authority to more modern forms of authority, much of this is about the uh, attempt to actually alleviate human misery. More importantly. The moral imagination, and this is for many people, a real sign of progress, 
and suffering, and I've already sort of intimated it in terms of the cosmopolitanism of suffering, is that our moral imagination begins to expand. And so that by that moral imagination, it's who we take into account as part of our community. It begins to expand, and it becomes this notion of progress. And, you know, this is partly why the abolitionist movement gets so much attention. Because here you have a situation where white Britons begin to demonstrate some kind of sympathy with Africans of a different, you know, of, of a different color that they've never met. This is what strikes many scholars of the abolitionist movement as so bizarre. This is not something that had ever been seen before. And so the question is, why is there this expansion of the moral imagination? And part of that definition of the expansion of the moral imagination is that it becomes possible for us to narrate the suffering of more categories of people along more dimensions. We are inclined now to narrate the suffering of the disabled, the aged, women, children, we have refugees, displaced persons. We have more and more categories of individuals who are identified in part by their suffering. Now, that's progress. Okay, I, I missed that one too, okay. Um, now, and, and this actually brings me to that's, uh, by the way, in case you missed Silence of the Lambs, uh, that's Anthony Hopkins. It's really a great movie, but anyway. Uh, but, and, and I don't know how, if you follow them, you'll, you'll, if you go see the movie, then you'll understand this slide, okay? Um, but essentially, what I want to argue then is that suffering is, I mean, humanity is parasitic on suffering. And another way to think about it then is that humanity is parasit is part of the necrotic. It feeds off the dead. It requires other people to suffer in order to exist. Our notions of humanity can only be oxygenated by other people's misery and death. This suggests then that suffering is not just a fact of life, but has to be made meaningful. And this is sort of a, you know, this is kind of a, uh, a very simple-minded view of, you know, in, in many ways, this, the function of religion. But the idea, though, is that we have to make suffering miserable. We can't just say, I can't explain it. That makes suffering meaningless. Unnecessary, and, and that's something that we can't live with. And many religions, especially those in the Abrahamic tradition, have ways to try to make sense of suffering, and in fact, and sometimes organize their entire religion around suffering. So the, the death of Christ, the crucifixion, the book of Job, the idea that religious communities are going to be made to suffer as a trial or a test or a punishment for their sins. I just finished a book which I really encourage you to buy. Um, it's really fun, okay? Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's called uh, The Star and the Stripes, The Histories of the Foreign Policies of American Jews. Uh, and you know, this is where, you know, I didn't know anything about American Jews before I began. Part of it came from the work I've been doing on humanitarianism and faith-based humanitarianism. And one of the things, you know, if you study the history of Jews, it's basically the history of suffering. Okay? I mean, that's pretty much what it is. And in fact, it goes so far that one historian of, of contemporary Judaism said that it's lacrimosian. That you can't actually think about the Jewish people without narrating it as a set of suffering. That's the only way to narrate it. It's from one genocide or cleansing or holocaust to another. Um, Pat Robertson, after September 11th, 
said that what had happened in New York was retribution because of the sinners in New York City. It was kind of a Sodom and Gomorrah argument. They're evil, and so they're being punished for their wickedness. He's uh, uh, one of the sort of major evangelical figures in American society. There is, though, this idea, though, of the secular, and that it's the secular that also needs to explain the existence of suffering. And one of the more bizarre comments, I mean, America is really bizarre right now. Uh, and one of the more bizarre comments that, I, that uh, came out after the hurricanes in Texas was from a Democratic um, uh, official from the state of Florida who essentially said, this is God punishing Texas for voting for Trump. Okay? Now, I, I don't know if you agree or not. Um, I thought it was a little odd. Uh, but in fact, you know, what's, what's been interesting for me uh, in this kind of Trumpian moment is the extent to which people who are on the other side of the aisle feel the need to explain away that Trump will make us better. Uh, it'll really produce a new form of progress and social solidarity. And I just look at them and go, you know, this is, you're trying to make sense of a miserable moment. Uh, that it really, you know, I'm going to sort of take that little bit of, of, of lemons and turn it into lemonade, as we would say. Now, this is something I want to suggest that's not true just of, of partisan politicians, but is that it's also true in a lot of liberal political, contemporary liberal political theory. This is John Rawls, who, you know, according to some people, might be uh, 20th century's greatest liberal political theorist. And here he argues, I believe that the very possibility of a social order can itself recon reconcile us, uh, itself to uh, the social world. This possibility is not a, a mere logical possibility, but one that connects with deep tendencies and inclinations of the social world. For as long as we believe for good reasons that a self-sustaining and reasonably just political and social order, both at home and abroad, is possible, we can reasonably hope that others will someday, somewhere, achieve it. This, as he says, will help us rescue us from the dangers of resignation and cynicism. It's not an argument that progress is happening, rather it's an argument that we need it. If we don't have that sense, in, in this case later I'll talk about justice, if we don't have the sense that there is hope, there must be hope, we're, we're lost. Now I just wanted to um, note that, um, well I'll, I'll hold that slide for a second, that um, this is one of, for me, one of the great concepts out of uh, religious studies and, and, and some sociology and anthropology. And this kind of encapsulates a lot of what I've been wrestling with, actually, for, I, I guess now, about 20 years, uh, since I first started working on issues of global governance. And this kind of, this concept in, in many ways sort of set me on um, uh, this other incredibly important book I wrote. Uh, it's a joke, okay, um, on, on the Rwanda genocide. And this is a concept of theodicy. It was made famous by Weber. And basically, the question is, how do we explain the persistence of evil in a divinely ordered world? Now, this is a theological challenge. And it's a theological challenge, especially for those religions like Christianity that believe that there's a conception of a trans transcendental unitary God who is loving and omnipotent. And to the extent that you believe that, it creates a gap between those religious beliefs and the persistence of evil. And then for, for Weber, the question of theodicy is how you reconcile that. How you reconcile the world of hope and progress with the world of evil that you see around you. Such thinking, I think, becomes a staple of enlightenment thought with the belief in reason and the ability to improve the world. We need to make sense. 
of the suffering. The Lisbon earthquake, um, this is probably why I was excited because I've been reading all about the Lisbon earthquake uh, of 1755, uh, was maybe the foundational moment in which a lot of these arguments got waged. I mean, this was a crucial moment in the history of the Enlightenment, and what was interesting was the debate about how you make sense of the earthquake. Because the earthquake was of near biblical proportions, right? It begins with a tsunami. And then it then you have uh, you have floods and drownings and then fires and buildings are being crushed. Lisbon is wiped as we know it. And it became a debate for the theologically and secularly minded. Uh, for the theological, it was that Lisbon was being punished for the sins of, in some ways, of colonialism, but of other forms of oppression, or not being faithful enough to God. They had lost their way. Others felt that to leave the argument at the feet of God was to ignore the human role of both suffering and its alleviation. This is actually one of the first times I've seen where there's discussions about the fact that natural disasters aren't natural, that there are human causes, because as many, uh, many of the debates that were waged was about why did suffering happen in some areas more than others. Some people escaped, others didn't. And so then the question is, as you rebuild, we can actually rebuild Lisbon in a way that reduces suffering. And if we think that it's just simply an act of God, we're going to lose that moment in which we can actually make a change. And then there were those like Voltaire, that's from Candide, one of his famous books, and, it's, and, and the first run of it was through Lisbon, who found it comical that individuals would try to find a silver lining in such horrors. It is the best of all possible worlds. Now, sometimes the suffering is not caused by evil on the outside, outside the West, but it's evil that comes from us. It is moments when rationality becomes irrationality, where progress becomes a justification for exterminating entire populations. <coughs> And this is where, you know, in modernity, as the critical theorists would say, turns on itself. It causes us then, to stare into, in some sense, what I would like, I'm increasingly thinking, as the abyss. Who have we become? I, that's the debate about Auschwitz. Who are we? And especially in these debates about Auschwitz and the Holocaust, it was how could the Germans, who were the example of civilized society, have committed such crimes? How do we explain such moments? How do we explain the Holocaust, trench warfare, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I mean, a lot of these are also bound up with the, with the fear, the Frankensteinian fear, that science and technology would be the death of us. And we still have those arguments about climate change. Rwanda, that's at the bottom. <coughs> these are moments where We need to find some way to repair. That, and you know, I've begun to go through some of the documents from the debates over the League of Nations. And what's really quite striking to me now that I've got this lens is the extent to which individuals who are debating the League and thinking about a new order are also at the same time talking about these kinds of nightmares. What have we become? And so 
there's an abyss here. There's a crisis of self and faith. And I think there's also, and this is important, a sense of atonement. That when leaders gathered together, whether it was at, you know, for the UN Charter or in Versailles, or as I saw firsthand uh, with regard to responsibility to protect. The issue really is about how we recognize the dead. That if the dead are allowed, to, if we don't acknowledge the dead and do better, then their lives are meaningless. <coughs> it's the ghosts that haunt. And as a consequence, you know, we, what we need, I think, is a kind of spiritual labor to restore humanity and progress. That these are moments in which people talk about them as evil. And it's not evil that others do, it's evil that's within inside of us. And as a consequence, we need to engage in an acknowledgement and a repair. These are two quotes, lengthy, but, um, and so I won't read them. But this one's from Jeffrey Alexander, the other one is from two sociologists, Levy and Schneider. And essentially what they're, what they're capturing in the post-World War II, post-Auschwitz moment is that, the fact, as he says, the vast human sacrifices demanded by the winds of war were measured and judged in terms of the progressive narrative and the salvation of promise. The blood spilled in war sanctified the future peace and obliterated the past. The sacrifice of millions could be redeemed, the social salvation of the sacred souls achieved not by dwelling in a lachrymose manner on their deaths, but by eliminating Nazism, the force that caused their deaths, and by planning the future which would establish a world in which there could never be Nazism again. And then a similar uh, sentiment by Levy and Schneider as he talks about the Holocaust as a challenge to universal enlightenment, a premises of re reason and rationality. It was the central question of the Holocaust is the part of modernity or the opposite a return to barbarism representing the breakdown of modernity. These are fundamentally spiritual challenges. They're questioning the fundamental nature of the West. And the consequence is then, we must insulate ourselves from those demons. We can't let that evil or those our own demons rise again. And those demons are nationalism. And for me, national, I mean, this is, you know, as an international relations individual, uh, it's that nationalism that personifies, and this is the way a lot of international relations scholars see it, is the nation is one thing, but nationalism is quite another. And it's nationalism that leads to chauvinism, to patriotism, to forms of xenophobia. I mean, the, so the, 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 express, the political expression of these sentiments now become encapsulated in the form of nationalism as an ideology. And so there is this constant fear that what nationalism as an ideology of exclusion is in some ways the source of some of our demonic tendencies. It brings out the worst in us. And as a consequence to combat that, we need to develop cosmopolitanism. We need to overcome. We need to recover humanity. And the consequence then is, as I see it, a kind of action-reaction process in which these moments of barbarism that are caused by ideologies of exclusion force the West to become better. They need to rescue their own identity. They will inform and they will build an international community. And so an international community that gets built is supposed to be built on a sense of inclusion through these kinds of cosmopolitan institutions that will reduce suffering and then recertify our humanity. Part of what I, and this is, you know, now I'm really on speculative territory. Uh, oh, look, okay, so 
I just want you to know either I have a heavy thumb or... Come on. Oh, uh, I got to go forward again? Are you going to do it? Oh, beginning of... Yeah! Wow. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if they have merit increases in the same way, but we should, but this is deserving. Okay. Um, you know, as, as I try to, you know, I, I would say that a lot of my work over the last 10 years is trying to understand what humanitarianism is about. I don't understand it. It, 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 for me, it's a very curious phenomenon. And part of the reason I don't understand it is, and the more I got into it, the less I understood, is because humanitarianism is, a, is about the relief of the suffering of others. The problem is, one of the things we know is, we're not really good at it. A lot of humanitarian action does not work. It just doesn't work. I mean, I hate to say it, but it just doesn't work. Um, it works certainly in some moments and sometimes, but the amount of money we spent on humanitarianism, $26 billion last year, doesn't really, I think, deliver what is being spent. And this is something that people within the humanitarian uh, community really do wrestle with. But then the question is, what is going on? And it might be, we just need to keep trying harder. You know, there's always that, we just need more money. It's the lack of money that's going to do it. I, I think that's right. Um, but I also think what humanitarianism is about is not necessarily saving other people's lives. It's about saving our own. It's about not meeting other people's material needs. It's about meeting our spiritual needs. We need it. It is, as one scholar put it, the last saving idea. And so if we don't have humanitarianism, which for some people is about a politics of refusal, that we refuse to allow the world to treat individuals as human waste, we're lost. So in many ways then, it's a desperate attempt to make meaning out of suffering to give us, in some way, a very uncomfortable term in, the humani term in the humanitarian community, which is a politics of hope. And as they will often say, I need to act. I can do no other. And if I don't act, what does it tell me about what we've become? It's a mark of their own inhumanity. Human rights, I want to suggest, also has very similar rhythms that you find a lot of the major human rights innovations you know this is on a, on a, on a I would say on a, on a smoother trajectory but certainly some of the most major uh, human rights documents and texts are themselves coming from moments of mass where rights have been massively violated And in some ways, that's understandable. You see mass violations of human rights, you want to do something to respond to it. Uh, and we need to do something to respond to it. According to one study of the Universal Declaration of <coughs> Human Rights, what World War II did was unleash a social anxiety, precisely because the world had been turned upside down. In response, the international community, and this is the scholar's terms, engaged in a process of political myth-making, myth which helped to channel the community's beliefs and practices, not, not the outcome, but beliefs and practices in a desirable direction. This is comparable to the argument that Stephen Hopgood makes in The End Times of Human Rights, in which he basically, in which, you know, part of what he argues, which is actually, can, I, I, I've drawn a lot from his work over the years, what part of what he argues is that humanitarian human rights and somewhat humanitarianism, human rights, is a salve for the spirit. And as we work out these contradictions, we just keep building higher and higher on shakier grounds. And his argument then is we get to a point in which there's a crisis of human rights, in part because of the presumption that human rights is universal. 
it's about a cosmopolitan spirit. And if you are to concede that it's not universal, what are you left with? And then finally, international justice. And you know, here I think there, there is a strong relationship between these sort of movements of international uh, of suffering and international justice, in part because every moment of despair, and here I'm quoting Susan Neiman, um, require in the face of other suffering requires a response in order to restore the conviction that the world should work on principle. We need justice. We need justice not simply to balance the scales. We need justice to save us. It helps us say that the world makes sense. The world works on principle. Now, there are different forms of justice. Some justice, like in a Rawlsian justice, is about the allocation of resources. That justice is basically some people getting the resources that they deserve. This is part of the veil of ignorance. And so it's about, you know, this is where people like Thomas Pogey and others who talk about world poverty, for them justice is about the, the fair distribution of the world's wealth. For others, though, it's about the need for punishment. That those individuals who committed such crimes should not be able to do so with impunity. This is what Catherine Sickick means by the justice cascade. And I've always, it's a brilliant book, but I've always thought the cascade argument was also about the argument of the inevitability that justice would prevail. And so there's nothing that will more quickly destroy our faith in the world that we think should operate on principle than the idea that perpetrators go unpunished. Nuremberg trials were not just backward looking, but you know, as you go through some of the testimony, some of the arguments of, of Justice Jackson and others, it was about trying to create a better international community. Uh, I've seen interviews with members of the founders of the Rome Statute of the ICC <coughs> argue that what we're trying to do is, you know, restore a sense of justice to the world. We're going and, and the ICC then represents a firmer foundation for the international community. That's how they talked. So these, you know, and the the whole notion, I have to say, having having followed Rwanda so so closely over the years, I mean, one of the for me one of the big heartbreaks of Rwanda was that you had not that there should not have been a war crimes tribunal but rather that the West felt such a need to invest in a war crimes tribunal when in fact it did nothing to stop the genocide. This was a way of atonement. We did not do what we could have because, you know, when good men do nothing. And so as a consequence, we'll provide justice mechanisms as in Bosnia as elsewhere. I am not trying to dismiss the idea that they actually deliver a sense of justice for people, but I'm also trying to suggest that there are a way for us to actually help us reinvigorate our own sense of humanity. Now the big question for me, and this is where I may be letting the contemporary events get away from me, because there are Individuals who argue that this can only go on so far. You know, at some point you hit the end of the road. You can't keep dipping into the spiritual well as if it's a, a renewable resource. It's not. And so they talk about the end of theodicy. And in contrast to narratives of progress, Increasingly, what I see are narratives of precarity. I don't know about you, but the world doesn't feel so safe to me anymore. It feels more precarious. When I see public opinion polls of young Americans, and, and also of older Americans, they're pretty convinced that the younger generation will not do as well as this generation. They say it with a conviction. 
There, and they, they're imagining then that there will be an end of the, as they would put it, the end of the American dream. And so when we talk about precarity, the point isn't whether, in fact, people have a really good grasp of reality. Don't they know that war has been in decline? Don't they nor, know that we're seeing more expansion of human rights and principles of tolerance? Don't they know that we're seeing a decline in poverty? Don't we know that more young girls are being educated than ever before? These are the kind of objective measures that people can point to and say, hey, the world's getting better. Now, those, that data might be right, but it doesn't necessarily make us feel better. We still feel as if the world is precarious. We begin to worry that the world is falling apart. That humanity and progress seems to be built on shakier foundations, and we need to repair, but we don't have the resources to do so anymore. This is what Emmanuel Levinas called the end of theodicy. It refers to a condition in which our attempts to understand and explain everything, including suffering, evil, genocide, and such, simply fail. They reach a limit and cannot go beyond it. This is the post-Auschwitz debate among Jewish theologians and, and others. How can you go on? How can you find meaning? It's over. So where do people turn? And, you know, again, here I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm on, a, on a very weak, weak branch. But my sense is that people turn inward. What they do is they you know, increasingly turn away from the idea of cosmopolitanism and ideologies of inclusion and return once again to nationalism and ideologies of exclusion. A greater need to turn inward. And the consequence then is that what I see anyway is that there's a growing disconnect between the universal aspirations of the West and the institutions it's built to reaffirm its Western identity and the increasingly overburdened foundations on which they rest. We built an international community on a symbolic level, but I'm not sure we're moving in that direction. And so how do we understand that relationship and have we gotten to the end of the Odyssey? Uh, I thank you for your patience. Uh, appreciate your your uh, your attention, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you.